All right, so our uh, next uh, speaker is um, Reinhard Kugler, who has uh, extensive background in uh, cyber defense, in uh, reverse engineering, and pen tests, and the likes. Um, he worked uh, with uh, diverse companies on extending their uh, security capabilities for their products. And currently he works for SBA Research, and he's going to talk to us about uh, security uh, for uh, embedded automotive software. So please welcome Reinhard, if you're ready. Almost. Oh, <laughs> Night Trader. Yeah, hand you the mic. Can you turn the... Ah. All right, who in this room knows this concept car? That's around 20% and it's really, really old, right? Are you sure you don't know it? <laughs> Because this concept car was super cool from the beginning, right? It has all the things we dream of right now. It has autonomous driving, right? David Hasselhoff was able to drive in his seat reading a book without the eyes on the street, which is now not allowed, but it was possible back then, and all the engineers are trying to establish exactly this line of safety. And if you go forward, it also has voice control, right? You can talk to it and say, hey, kid, bring me to uh, the bad guys. Right now, not so intelligent, but you can already include voice commands in your systems. And you have a pretty much more modern looking infotainment system than back then in the 90s, right? So all of this, of course, drives complexity a lot. And if you're like me, I always try to open up things and to understand them. So what I did back then, as the EEPC came out and no tablets were available, I opened my car, I, I disassembled the EEPC and built it to my car. And I was really lost because I wanted to connect it also to the onboard systems that I can create an infotainment system on my own and also can add GPS tracking and maps navigation in my old Golf from my grandpa. So I wasn't really successful back then because nothing was available. But if you want to join in right now into security testing or engineering in the automotive domain, you have much more at your disposal. But still, the security posture is like, you wouldn't hack a car, right? So what you usually look at is, you want to look at the IoT.10, right? So you, you want to look at the most um, weaknesses or most used weaknesses in that domain and understand how it works. So what we, let, let's do this together. If you, like me, you, I want to look into the car and you, if you do that, need to understand how the car works. And the car is just an enormous network of embedded systems. They're usually built in something like this, like a casing or metal, but in there there's a PCB with a microcontroller and a operating system or just plain old real-time operating system or just uh, plain old uh, code that's running on that thing. And all of this is interconnecting using electrical bus systems or network systems. So, how does, how does the, those boxes come from? 
they come from vendors and they outsource it. So if you, I don't know, go to a famous brand and buy a very, very expensive car, if you have the money, I don't have it. But if you have the money, you can go to, to, a, to a brand and brand assembles the car by those components and give you the final product. But they outsource again to different vendors who supply the parts and they again um, outsource it to, again, vendors to build, for example, software for that. And you can imagine that supply chain that's building up doing this is pretty complicated. And indeed is more, the more realistic problems in that domain. So not long and the cheap hack came around, which was the blueprint for more or less every um, every attack we see and every talk we uh, we hear on the automotive domain, and they show have shown how to remotely attack a car via the cellular -like network, enter it, enter the infotainment system, and finally, by overwriting a chip, steer the car, which is a huge safety problem. But this more or less shook up the automotive industry in terms of security. And not, not long after, we saw things like this, where Bluetooth speakers have been reprogrammed to hack your car. So if you're a car thief, you can buy one of those, plug it into your headlight. So you, you rip the headlight off, pull the, the speaker in, push a button, and this opens up your car. So again, some vulnerabilities there, and more recent hacks are more on component level, because of course the automotive industry steps up their game in embedded systems and the whole networking. And of course, now it's pretty hard to attack a quite recent car, but it still works. So, what also on legislation level happened is we need to, or the car manufacturers um, need to, hello, um, the car manufacturers need to prove that your car is cyber secure. So they need to test it and um, show the authorities that they did their homework. And of course, there is a standard on that. If you want to read it up and you approach the automotive industry, you need to show how you um, safely develop your, your car component. All right, so how can we, can we start hacking or how can we start testing? From, from my perspective, from a more engineering perspective, I'm always like to test something. So how can we test a car or car part for vulnerabilities? The threat landscape is huge because you have many cellular and Wi-Fi and radio signals going back and forth in, into your car and to the outside to, for example, to open it, but also to communicate to the infrastructure or to another car. Hey, there was an accident. I want to report that, for example. But also, inside the threat landscape is quite impressive. So how can you test it? You can either just take one module, your car key, open it up, an embedded system shows up, and you disassemble it and try to figure out how the keying works, maybe. Or you go more into the network of the, of the car, the internal car network. Again, the, those are the different components interconnected with bus systems and look for weak spots like the car thieves did. So if you look closely on this diagram, you see, hey, the headlight on the left or top is on the same bus system as the door control, this turquoise system. And this is what they did, right? They, send the correct message to open it up. So this can also be your starting point for attacks to attack the car network. Or 
um, you jump into the development, as we do as research center and consulting, we try to help the engineering to, to find the bugs, like to find the, the, as we saw in the, in the first session, in the keynote, to find the, the weak spots in mem on memory safety, but also we have discussed in the, in the whole afternoon how to um, maybe find a, a weak spot. Or you take one part like this and find a way to attack it. So you wouldn't do, uh, you wouldn't uh, test the equipment, or you, you wouldn't use your equipment to test it, right? This is also one um, idea what in the car industry is quite permanent, permanently um, established. You wouldn't do that, right? But as a security tester, we can do it. We can rip it out. We can find what, what it is. We can look at the diagrams, even if they're in just some tuning forums, and find out the pins that does the communication to the car network. And again, maybe also open it up and find the pins there if they don't show up on the outside. So to communicate with the car, we need special adapters, which are not very special at all. They just talked, not IP, they talk CAN, like the CAN bus. So they create a waveform that gets interpreted by, the, by your box. And you take one of those, you can get them for $5 or for $300 or $2,000. So if you need an, like, hint what to take, just, just ping me. But you can create a setup like this where you have a power supply and your, um, and your device hooked up on the right and maybe um, also put in some, some more of the, uh, of the car parts like steering wheel or engine control unit which controls how your, your engine works and connect it to your PC, and then you can send signals there, right? What do, you, what do you send? You send what's on the bus. Who knows can? That's cool. I had to read it up because I, some years ago, I wasn't really, 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 really proficient with that. But for the most part, you all know that, you need just CAN 2.0, right? So the, the basic version where you have an ID and data and you send it and some of the ECUs, these electronic control units, those boxes, pick it up. So you, the, the rest is just the, like, how the bus system works, right? You, you all know that, so... Let's look how we can test it. And if you, if you get in touch with cars, please don't do it with your own car or your wife's car, like me. Please don't do that, because it could kill you, literally. So be very careful what you do. Try to, I don't know, go to the scrapyard and get one of the boxes for 50, 50 euros, and you can start. But in your own car, the airbag can go off and break your ribs or injure you. So please be careful. Having that said, of course you can do something. So for example, we can hook up our instrument cluster like I did. So I ripped out this thing and hooked it up to my machine and I tried to um, uh, find information on that. New. Whoops. Um, Save. What, what you'll see here is, is just a toy example. It all flickers and blinks and does something with the controls. Just to get a feeling, hey, that's all software and it's all data flowing back and forth. Because my impression first was, that's all mechanic, right? Mechanical parts. But it's indeed just information flowing back and forth. And you see quite quickly that you need to know which 
information you send. Otherwise, you, can, you get just this. You, can, you don't know which data, which IDE, what bit you have to change um, to issue one specific function. And this is also what we are doing as a research center to find ways to efficiently test something like this. So, of course, can or, or just fuzzing is not the, the, end, the holy grail or the end of the story. You can also use diagnostic systems, right? So you can use, for example, what a car technician uses, and they use the CAN bus again, and on top of that, they use a different protocol to talk to your car. And this is what, if you bring, an, bring in your car to a repair shop, and they plug it in, and they quickly say, yeah, your engine has a problem, or this sensor has a problem. And I was wondering, what, how can you tell? They didn't even open up the, the, the hood, right? They're using, like, they're using this. They're using a diagnostic system, like this gentleman over here, and they plug, it, plug in a, an adapter to your car, talking CAN messages back and forth, exchanging diagnostic information. Of course, this is quite sensitive, right? Because maybe there's information there you don't want to share with anybody. Therefore, you not only get this overview information, there are also protections that hinders you from a readout. And that, that's called the UDS service, the Unified Diagnostic Service. And there are also like authentication systems and transmission um, or security tra transmission services to be usable in that service. Indeed, that's quite complicated to implement because the standard, I, uh, I bought the standard for $150, read it, and it says you can choose your own encryption standards. Always a good idea, right? This leads to, unfortunately, something like this. This is standardized, so the, the key exchange is standardized, but not how the key looks like, how long it should be, and um, how the entropy works, what random sources you should use, et cetera, et cetera. You all know this, right, from embedded systems. But in automotive, it's sometimes problematic because there are very simplistic implementations in place for exactly that challenge response handshake. So, of course, you can do it on your own. If you, if you want to use Python a lot, you can download a tool called Scapy, where you can more or less write your own scripts, like I did, for the diagnostic systems and send exactly those bytes to your ECUs and your car. And this really helps up with testing, because before that, usually only limited test systems are in place. But with a scripting language like this, you can come up with more complicated test cases. So if you do testing, I really encourage you to look into Scapy. All right, so we're coming to closely an end and, and to the end of the, this, this talk. Would you open the case? I would. So what, what we did is we took a screwdriver and tried to open the metal cases around the more juicy um, electronic control units like the engine control, storing some of the secrets. Because as you can imagine, one of the intellectual property of a company building engines and the engine controllers is how the exact timings are. And if you can steal that, as maybe also in, the, um, in this leak, which led to a recall of many cars, you, of course, can get this intellectual property and maybe the keys and the passwords. So if you do that, be very careful, the glue is is hazardous and 
I nearly killed my uh, my colleague because I slipped <laughs> with the with the screwdriver. But if you're done with this whole thing, for example, you can hook up your oscilloscope or your logic analyzer and try to figure out what's on specific interfaces and chip pins, right? So you can, for example, on the left, we looked at an infotainment system, and on the right, you see the decoded version of the uh, debug interface, which shows you that it's a Windows CE platform running on this machine, which I found really interesting. But you can also, for example, hook it up with a microscope and those really fancy probes and try to bring the, ma the machine or this, uh, this ECU, this control unit, into another boot mode, to boot into an update mode or a maintenance mode. And this really helps up with the actual analysis. Of course, sometimes this exposes JTAG as well, as you all know. That could be problematic because it can then pull sometimes the firmware and sometimes it's not encrypted. Right, so what can we take away from that? Because we're we are all in embedded. Some years ago, VW and many other companies said, we will build or produce tablets on wheels. And right now, today, I think we're at this point. We have Android in our car, we have CarPlay, we have our on fancy systems, we reached this area. And we are already encountering many problems in terms of weak passwords, weak keying, weak cryptography, insecure update mechanisms, you name it. So most of the IoT top 10 apply. But the next push is happening right now while the different systems are now being centralized on central platforms, virtualized, and segregated from, from their super safe counterparts in terms of safety. So right now, there's the separation taking place, collecting many of the software units on one big machine, which is just an ARM platform, and having the embedded systems, which are mostly real-time operating systems, still in place. This should free up resources as well as networking, as well as weight. And you will be seeing a lot of over-the-air updates for your car. And if you have already a new car, you may be experienced this, that your car needs to be stationary while updating your car you will see this a lot more because also the embedded systems should be securely updated. Having that said, if you're interested in Vienna, please join us. We are doing meetups and hacking challenges as well as working also a lot on Linux in the embedded systems domain. Consulting as well, just a a quick shout out, if you're interested to talk more about this whole automotive embedded systems and hacking stuff on cars, please let me know and I thank you for your attention. Looks like the questions and comments, I see one here. What's your opinion on the trajectory of the overall car security? Is it getting better or is it all going downhill until people are going to be killed? Um, sorry, I didn't catch the which project. Uh, what, what's your opinion? How is, car, how is car security evolving? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Is it always the same in recent years and your outlook for the next years? That's a, that's a good one. <laughs> Um, in my opinion, the car manufacturers are putting themselves into a quite tough space because 
till almost 10 years ago, they tried to take safety as a high priority target and didn't include many features. Therefore, our infotainment systems looked not very nice. This changed some years ago, and now the systems getting more and more complex, autonomous driving is taking place, needs much more computing power, and this opens up for the worse, much more vulnerabilities we will see in the future, I think. Um, thanks for the presentation. I was wondering how you see autonomous driving going. Of course, there are different levers, uh, yeah, but we have been promised uh, like for some time already that all the cars will be driving around. We don't need any bus drivers, etc., anymore. But that doesn't seem to be the case. On the contrary, it seems to be slowing down because like, obviously it costs a lot uh, and people actually like driving cars, right? <laughs> Uh, so, so what's your take on that? How, how will that industry evolve? Because it also has a huge impact on the software ecosystem and also consequently on the security side. That's very interesting because I recently had a talk exactly on the topic uh, with, with a domain expert because I'm just a security tester or a security person, right? So I can just do the observation, but my observation is um, we will be seeing something like autonomous driving on the highway really, really soon. In urban areas, I think companies will be backing up just because of the safety and legal implications if just one incident is, is happening and severely Any other questions? Yeah, I see you over there. Um, in the gate where you showcased, uh, it was running Windows SE or something like that? Okay, then I misunderstood that. Okay, yeah, I was scared for a second. <laughs> Um, in, uh, to comment on that, uh, indeed, the, uh, the Windows CE was used in an infotainment system. Um, the gateways are usually right now embedded systems that are like handling one side of the canvas and another and routing it to, inter uh, to Ethernet as well, for example. But will be more software defined in the future, in my opinion, because all of it has to communicate with everything. Because if, if you're like re-entering from the autobahn or for the highway, uh, <laughs> the suburban area, your, your music, if you're listening to Rammstein or something, the music needs to be a little, little bit less loud. So, and so there's information going back and forth. All right, any last questions? No? Then let's uh, thank our speaker again. <laughs> <laughs>